就是帽子。这、就是这、就是一这、就是一个我们之前上过课程，我学过的一个，把主人讲就是，他会给你个。那你把这个除以一百，是不是等于一次十一？你把这个 mod mod 一百就 mod 就知道，差不多就没有得了。All right. So why don't you all take the next、uh, couple minutes and take a look at the little sample of code we have on the slides. And what I'd like you to do is step through it, write all of the steps down, and see how far you can get. And you're allowed to work together, whatever you prefer. The one thing I will say is don't use Dr. Rackett's built-in stepper to do this because its stepping rules are a little bit different. So make sure you're using the ones that we use. Now, if you hold on to the concept, there's a little bit of a 
All right. So you've had a few minutes then to look at the stepping problem that's here. And uh, we'll get the first step here written down. And uh, so the question is, what is the first step that we're going to do? What's the first step? What's the first substitution now? Yeah, so we're going to substitute the list into the function body. A list is a value. A list is a value. So long as all of the elements of the list are value, that is fine. There's no additional processing we need to do that. So that's great. Um, now, writing all that cons out is a real pain in the ass. Uh, so I am going to abbreviate it. But please understand that it is still there and you still need to know what follows. Um, I appreciate you may not want to write it all. So what we're going to do is fill it into the body. And I'm going to turn the lights on here to make it a little bit more clear. Center. There we go. So we've got and. I'm going to use this dot dot here to kind of represent the list. Like that. All right. What's the next step? After this. Yep, we're going to take the first of the list. And then, of course, now we've got equals to second. So now we're going to evaluate second. Which is going to also give us a 2. And then we can finally evaluate the first argument. And, uh, and that's going to give us true. Now, this is where and and or differ from a lot of the other substitution rules that we've had. We have a true value here. If this was a plus operator or anything else, we would leave this and move on to evaluating the second argument. But when we have an and or an or, and in this case an or and false, or and and true, we're going to do the same thing. And true. Okay. That means 
that whatever this and is going to produce is 100% coming from the other arguments. So we're actually going to eliminate this in the next step because it doesn't matter. And then we're going to put the next part, which is the second argument to the and, which is and first of the list and the third of the list. And then, of course, from here, we're going to repeat this whole process. The first argument of the and is now, oh, it's an expression. Well, we better evaluate it. And the first argument to the equals is also a, an expression, so we need to evaluate that. So and equals first of the list is 2. I think you can see why I am omitting writing out the whole cons thing each time. Because it's a pain. <coughs> yeah. I am probably missing a bracket. I'm not paying careful attention to that. <laughs> I think that's where it is. For the record, I will try to do good with balanced brackets. And you need to make sure that you do, because on an exam, if you're missing a balanced bracket, you're going to lose a mark for that. Um, I'll try to be a bit more careful. But this is the number one syntax error people make in racket is missing brackets. All right, so we've got that evaluated there. Now we can evaluate third. I suppose you, can anyone see this line I'm writing right here? No, no? okay. I had a feeling. Let's do it up here. And so that was evaluating third. And now we can evaluate this one. So we get and 2 is equal to 2. And then with the other arguments that we would have is equal first of the list and the fourth of the list. There we go. All right. Now again, this is true here. And so the result that's produced by the AND expression is going to be whatever is produced by the remaining arguments. So we can eliminate this true. So we're down to AND, checking if the first of the list is equal to the fourth element of the list. There we go. Now we evaluate the first again. I will also try to spell things correctly. And then we can evaluate the fourth of the list. And of course, two and three are not equal. So we get and false. And in this case, this is just going to produce false. All right. Any questions about this, stepping through this? Yeah? On the exam, can we also omit stuff? No. <laughs> Unless we explicitly state you're allowed to omit stuff, you should never <coughs> omit stuff. Um, obviously, we are limited to board space here. If we're asking you a stepping problem on the exam, we're probably not going to ask you to write out a giant cons list, because that's a pain in the ass. And I know as you're working with list functions on assignment three and four and five, it's going to be a pain. You should define constants for your lists that you use in tests so that you don't have to keep writing all this con stuff out. Is there short forms? Yes. They're called list abbreviations. We will get to them. But until we get to them, you can't use the abbreviation. All right. Any other questions about this particular stepping problem? We will post more, by the way. I'm still working on them, but they are coming. Now, now I'm turning on all of the lights. All right, if you have your clickers, please do get them out. I'll give you uh, a minute 
up to one minute to do this particular one here. All right, anyone who has not clicked in, please do right now. Remember that even a wrong answer gets you a point. Okay, so let's see what everybody said. Most of you, 80% of you said E, more than one of the above. That is correct. More than one of these is equivalent to extracting the fourth element of the list. Which ones are they? How many of you say A gives you the fourth of the list? Because it does. Each time you call rest, you take a list and you produce a new list that doesn't contain the first element. So if you have the list one, two, three, four, five, and you call rest on that list, you get two, three, four, five. <laughs> Which means, that if you take the first of the rest of the rest of the rest of the list, that's the fourth element of the original list. How many of you say B works? It doesn't work. The B actually gives you the fifth element, and C and D also give you the fourth element. So the third item from the rest of the list <laughs> is the fourth item, and the second item from the rest of the rest of the list is also the fourth item of the list. Now, on many assignments, we only give you access to first and rest. Please do pay very careful attention to the instructions at the top. And you might be like, well, that's a pain. I need the eighth item. What I'm trying to point out here is that you don't need the function eighth. Because you can build eighth as the fourth of the rest of the rest of the rest of the list. <laughs> I think I was missing one there. Okay. Yeah. If you change A or like the first to also like change it to rest, you would also uh, so if we say the rest of the rest of the rest of the rest of the list? Yeah. No, because rest produces a list, not an item. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So one more clicker question then. This one is tricky. I'll give you a minute again. This is about data definitions, a topic we only very briefly talked about last week, which I know is five days ago, and so many things have happened in the last five days that probably have your attention. Uh, but let's see if you can remember what a data definition is for. All right, I'm going to stop this, so push your buttons. Let's see what everybody said. Most of you said A. A is not right. 
A data definition is not you creating a magical new type for Racket to use. Data definitions are for you. We created two data definitions in the last class. We created a data definition for a card. We said a card is a two element list where the first element is a symbol and the second element is a natural number between one and 13. That did not create a magical card type that Racket can now use and understand. According to Racket, it, it, that function still operates on a list. You haven't created a new type for Racket. You created a convenient name for you to use in your documentation of whatever code you're using. So instead of saying, I have a function that consumes a two element list where the first element is a symbol and the second element is a natural number that's between one and 13, you can say, I have a function that consumes a card. And the data definition is there to say what is the meaning of car. And we created another one for a point. And we can create them for lists. And you can create them for anything you want. If you want to define a new type for a human to read and understand, to be used in your contracts, let's say you wanted to create a type known as the uppercase letters. So you call that type uppercase. Then you would say an uppercase is one of, and then you would provide a list of all of the uppercase characters. That's a data definition. It's not something Racket's aware of. According to Racket, those are still strings or characters. It's something for you. So A is not correct. B is the correct answer. C and D and E are not correct because, as we saw last class, you don't have to have a data definition that is recursive. Our definition for a card or a 2D point, two point was not a recursive definition. It was simply a two element list. We specified exactly what the types of both of those elements had to be. And it doesn't have to be a list because I could technically make a data definition for uppercase letters or for numbers that are multiples of five. You can create a data definition for anything you want. It's going to help make your code more readable because now you can, in your contract, say a card. And then when somebody is looking at your function, they're like, oh, I see this function takes a card. Oh, what's a card? And then they scroll to the top of the file and they say, oh, there's what a card is. I understand. And then they can use your function and it, the documentation is smoother. It reads nicely. All right. Now, since the majority of you did not get this one, how about everybody, you have 20 seconds to push the letter B. There are no rebels in this room. There we go. All right. Two seconds. Somebody's not brave enough to be a rebel. <laughs> Okay, don't worry if you were in that boat where you decided to be a rebel, you're still going to get your correct point. Don't worry, I will make it so everybody gets the right answer. I'm always curious to see, though, without knowing that I'll do that in advance, how many people just anything against the machine. <laughs> By the way, if I was sitting in this room, I would have been the person clicking something other than me. All right. So before we get back into talking about data definitions and lists, there's a couple things I want to talk about. Number one, A0. Don't forget that if you haven't submitted it and got perfect on it, you can't get grades on any assignment until you do. Uh, don't forget assignment two, which I'm pretty sure is due today. You should get on that. Um, and of course, you've got the feedback from assignment one to help you with understanding where you went wrong with style marks. which you're going to find out very quickly are the largest reason you lose marks on these assignments. Um, the other thing I want to say is, so assignment three should be out. Assignment four will come out at the end of the week. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, as I'm sure many of you have noticed, some crazy stuff happened over the weekend. 
that is there is a coronavirus coming uh, around the world and a lot of people are quite terrified of it. Um, I'm not a medical doctor, but according to the numbers, it's not as bad as SARS, <laughs> uh, which maybe you don't remember the SARS outbreak. I, I definitely do. Um, so what I want to say, and this is actually the university has released a note regarding this as well. If you are sick, if you are not feeling well, please don't come to class. Um, number one, if you're sick and you're coming to class, you're probably not feeling very well, so you're probably not getting much out of class anyways. But furthermore, you're infecting all the lovely people around you. And even if you don't like them and you think it's funny to watch the world burn, please don't do it. It's just mean. Um, now, I know many of you are probably concerned, well, if I don't come to class, I'm missing out on whatever we did in class that day, or I'm missing out on the clicker marks. If it does actually become a problem here, which the, I guess the government is not foreseeing that that's going to be an epidemic in Canada at the moment. Um, if it does become a problem and we notice that a large portion of the class is missing, obviously we will do something appropriate with your participation marks. We're not going to penalize you for the fact that a virus took everybody out. That's unnecessarily cruel to people who just got a nasty virus. Um, so don't worry about that. And if you're worried about lecture content, there's a reason why there's a camera in the room. Um, you can just watch it on YouTube later. It's much better for you to just stay home if you're not feeling well. And if you're like, yeah, well, I'm sick, but it's probably just to just stay home. I don't get that. If I'm sick, I still have to be here, so. <laughs> I'm not sick. I am sensitive to this issue, however, because it's always an issue. I, I have two young kids and one of them goes to school. And parents always send their kids to school when they're sick. So I'm just, it's counting down the days till when does my daughter come home sick? Because if she comes home sick, that means the whole house is sick. I can't avoid her because, you know, I have to feed her and stuff. <laughs> Anyways, don't come if you're sick and don't panic. We will make sure you are well taken care of uh, with respect to your grades and the course content. Uh, that being said, I guess it's in Vancouver now, too. Which that's not a surprise. Um, anyway. Where did we leave off? We left off. Definitely not on that slide. We were talking about last class, and you may not remember, but we ended talking about this concept of a data <laughs> definition. And again, as we've just reiterated uh, with the clicker question here, we use the data definition to create a nice human readable type. And we've even done this for lists. So within our contracts, we are giving you one data definition that you don't have to define yourself, and that is the list of X type. Technically speaking, there is no magical list of X type in Racket. Racket has a list. A list is made up of anything, and we really do mean anything. Um, but for certain functions, obviously, we want to restrict them to operating on maybe a list of strings, or a list of cards, or a list of numbers. So we create this list of data definition, and if we have a list of X data definition, it's a list of X is one of empty. Or adding an item of type X onto a list of X. Anytime you have a list of X, you do not need to write the data definition. That's given for you. You can use it in the contract without specifying it. If, however, you wanted to have a list of strings or sandwiches, well, since the type of the contents of the list is not one thing, then you would need to create a data definition for that. So list of a single type, that is given to you. You do not have to create it. You can just use it wherever you need to. Now, that also brings up the discussion uh, of what this list was. So we. In Racket and in functional languages like Scheme and List, one of the biggest data types we have is a list. And it's in a very, very powerful type. And um, what's really fun about lists in Racket is that a list can contain anything. And I showed you some examples last class where we had a list of symbols and numbers. We even can put functions inside of them. 
And as we expose more and more of the bracket language, you can see even crazier kinds of lists. You can even have a list of empties, that is a list of empty lists, and you can have lists of lists of lists. But what is this list? How are we actually defining what a list is? Well, how we define what a list is in Racket is using a recursive definition. That is a definition that relies on itself. So we're saying a list is either empty or it's an item appended to some other list. So a list of one item is an item added to an empty list. And a list of two items is an item added to a list of one. And a list of five items is an item appended to the front of a list of four items. So this is a self-referencing definition. And this is not a new idea, especially if you've done anything in mathematics, because we have this. We have recurrence relations in math. Fibonacci sequence is one that we can define in this way. And there are many, many others. And if you are continuing on in computer science, whether it's you're already in CS or whether you're trying to switch into CS, you're going to see them a lot. You'll see them in CS240, you'll see them in 341. And if you take 466 or its equivalent 666, you'll see them even more. I didn't take that course. Why would you give a course that number? Anyways. So this is not new. Uh, all right. So this isn't enough. However, if we create a data definition, whether it's for a list of something or for some other random data type, it's not enough. We need more than that. You've told me what your type is, but you haven't shown me how you expect me to use it. And so as part of the data definition, we also want you to include what's known as a template. And a template is a function that is not filled in. It's a framework for, the t for all of the functions that you might imagine to operate on that particular data type. And if you think about it, this makes sense, that you could have a framework for functions that work on a particular type. If I have a card, a playing card, then most of the functions that we're going to work with a playing card are going to look at the suit and do something with the suit of the card, and they're going to do something with the value of the card. Most of the functions we wrote last class did something with the suit and the value. We could have created a template framework for those functions. And by giving this template, we're not just telling the user or the other developers that we're working with what the type is, we're also showing them how to use it. Your code should take people by the hand and it should be like, welcome to my home. See here my data types. See here my functions. You want people to have that warm welcome when they look at your code because then they'll understand what you've written. They'll know how to fix it. They'll know how to add to it. It's part of making readable code. So you need a data definition and then you need a template for it. So what do these templates look like? Actually, they're going to look a lot like the data definition. So looking at a list of X, let's start to build a template. Well, okay, if I have a list of something and I want to make a function that operates on that list, what if my list is empty? Then what I do in the case where my list is empty may be very different than what I do in the case where my list is not empty. So I start by creating this template. And you'll notice that the template function is not commented in Racket. You don't have to comment it. Racket does recognize that when you use the dot, dot, dots, that it's fine. That's valid syntax. It's going to be ignored. It's part of the teaching language. So I have a conditional expression inside my template function that says, OK, if the list is empty, we are going to do something. And if the list is not empty, then we're going to do something else. That's a good starting point. Not enough, though. Well, first off, if my list is not empty, then I know that there's at least one element in it. 
So technically speaking, checking whether the list is not empty isn't needed. I could get rid of the cons and uh, the cons question mark predicate and just put else. Still not enough though. Because we haven't really said what parts of the list we are using. Well, maybe it's a bit more accurate than to say this. If the list is empty, then I'm going to do something. And the something I'm going to do really depends on what the problem is. And if the list is a non-empty list, then I'm probably going to do something with the first element of the list. And I'm probably going to do something with the rest of the list. Because I'm trying to work with the list, which means I'm probably going to work with the elements of the list. Well, what elements do I generally have access to? First and rest. So in the case of a non-empty list, we do something with the first and something with the rest. We're getting closer. We're still not quite there. All right. Ah, now we have a template function that actually looks just like our data definition, except written as code. So in the case where the list is empty, we still just do something. But in the case where the list is not empty, we're going to do something with the first element of the list, and then we're going to do something with the rest of the list. And what are we going to do with the rest of the list? Well, presumably, if I'm doing something with the elements of the list, then whatever I do to the first element of the list, I probably want to apply the same thing to the remaining elements of the list. So I call the template function, and I pass it the rest of the list. And the dot, dot, dots are the whatever we are doing to the first of the list, and combining it with whatever we do to the rest of the list. This type of function is very special. What's very special about this function that we have here is that this function calls itself. Just like our data definition referred to itself. This is a recursive function. And recursion is going to be with you from today until the end of this course. And if you're sitting there thinking, when do I get to learn loops in this course? You don't. <laughs> the only thing you're learning in this course is recursion. If you want to learn loops, you're going to have to take CS136. There's no loops here. All right. Now, we can make templates for anything we want. So if I had a list of strings, and I want to create a template function to work on that list of strings, maybe I want to count how many items are in that list. This is the template that I would write. If the list is empty, I do something. Otherwise, notice we got rid of the cons here, the predicate. It's because if the list is not empty, it's obviously got at least one item in it. So we say else, I do something with the first of the list, and I combine that with the results of doing something to the rest of the list. Now, recursion is interesting. So if you look at the notes, they talk about recursion having two cards. You have a base case, the stopping condition, and you have a recursive case, the case where you call yourself. That's a very mundane description of what's going on here. Recursion is a way of thinking. And for most people, it's a very unnatural way of thinking. If I were to ask you, go home and write for me the steps that you take to wash your dishes. I'm going to assume you live at Icon Towers and your dishwasher's broken. You've got to do it by hand. Well, if you've got 10 dishes in the sink, then you're going to say, I pick up dish one, I wash dish one, I put it in the rack. And then I pick up dish two, and I wash dish two, and I put it in the rack. You are thinking what's known as iteratively. For i equals one to n, pick up dish i, wash dish i, put dish i in the rack. That is a very natural human way of thinking, and yet that is not recursive. But we can solve this dishwashing problem recursively very simply. If I am washing n dishes, let's say I'm washing five dishes. Well, 
washing the dishes with five dishes is equal to washing dish number five and combining that with washing four dishes. And washing four dishes is washing one dish and washing three other dishes, the results of washing three other dishes. Washing three dishes is washing one dish, combining that with two already washed dishes. We are taking a result for n minus 1 and combining it with the nth item. Does that sound familiar to anybody? There's some mathematical thing that that should be familiar to you with. Sounds like mathematical induction, doesn't it? You say, okay, well, for n equals 0, here's the answer. I now assume that this is true for n minus 1, and now I prove it for n. Well, that's showing that you can combine the result for n with the result that you're assuming is true for n minus 1. It's recursion. You can think of it in other ways. So maybe the dish problem doesn't make sense to you. What if I wanted to sum the numbers from 1 to 5? Iteratively, that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Recursively, the sum of the numbers from 1 to 5 is 5 plus the summer of the numbers from 1 to 4. And the sum of the numbers from 1 to 4 is 4 plus the sum of the numbers from 1 to 3. It's n combined with the solution from n minus 1. Problems that we can solve iteratively, we can also solve recursively. But it takes a change in your thought patterns to think about this. A lot of people think recursion is hard. So in other programs, like engineering, sorry, my husband is a computer engineer from here. He says recursion was covered in one lecture in his undergrad, and that was it. You're going to spend a whole term talking about recursion. They spent one class. And it was kind of like, yeah, here's this thing. You can do it. Nobody uses it. And if you use it at your company, your boss will fire you. OK, to be fair, that's probably true. <laughs> um, but it's actually a very valuable tool. So first off, recursion, one of the interesting things is because it is so tightly close to mathematical induction, if you solve a problem recursively, you should actually be able to prove that your code does exactly what you say it is on a piece of paper. That's pretty cool. Can't do that with a loop easily, but you can do it with a recursion easily. And that comes into play when we start looking at algorithms that work on graphs and trees which are data structures that we will introduce later on in this course. But if you continue on in CS 240 and 341, you'll also look at trees and graphs a lot more. And most of the algorithms that we apply to trees and graphs, we do recursively. One, because it helps us prove that the algorithm actually works. Um, another reason why some things that operate on trees and graphs are recursive is because, yes, we could solve it iteratively, so with loops, but the solution is messy. It's ugly. It's hard to read. There are some problems for which recursion is a beautifully elegant solution. Now, why would your boss fire you if you solve everything recursively? A number of reasons. Because most people in the world don't understand what recursion is doing. And so they see recursion and they're like, my eyes, I'm horrified by it. That's a good reason, somewhat. Um, or you could just learn what it is. Other people don't like recursion because it's very easy to make a mistake. It's very easy to end up with a problem where you have infinite recursion. With a loop, yes, you can also have infinite loops, but it's usually easy to identify an infinite loop. Recursion that's infinite is a little bit trickier. There are more catastrophic mistakes that can be made. So you have to be a lot more careful with it. Another reason why people generally don't like recursion because recursion is, generally speaking, slower than iteration. So if I had to sum the numbers from 1 to n, and I had a choice of using a loop, which is iteration or recursion, and you chose recursion, okay, I'd fire you. That's stupid. You're not going to learn in this course why recursion is so much slower, 
Maybe while stepping through the problem, doing some recursion stepping, you'll see why, but we're not anticipating that you understand what's underneath and why it's slower, but it is slower generally. And if you take 136, you'll start to see it, but it's in 241 where you really see where recursion <laughs> keeps things slow. I work in computer graphics, and we, generally speaking, do not use recursion. Not good for us. <coughs> All right. Powerful tool, though. So, how do we write a function that computes the number of items that are in a list? Well, there's a solution here, but that's for strings. I want to do it over here, just for fun. So, first off, I want to write a recursive function to count the number of items in the list. All right. Well, in order for me to figure this out, I have to ask myself, how can I think about this problem recursively? Well, the number of items in the list is one plus the item, number of items in my list of n minus one. It's the nth combined with the solution for n minus one. That's my recursive step. And of course then my base case is going to be the list is empty. So if the list is empty, what value should we presume, produce? Zero, because the list is empty. There's no items. Yes, this is a horribly named function. It's because length is actually a built-in function, so I can't call it length. Uh, all right. So in order to compute the length of the list, I have a base case. And the base case is, is the list empty? And if the list is empty, the thing I want to do is produce zero because an empty list has no items. Now, the else. I already said that if your list has n items, that's equal to 1 plus the length of a list of n minus 1 items. Now, of course, I don't know that there are n minus 1 items in the list. So what I'm actually going to do is plus 1. And then I call the length of the list, not on list, but the rest of the list. I've already processed the nth element. Now I need to show that I'm add, combining that result with the result from the rest of the list. There we go. And now if I pass a list in, there you go. Here's the length of the list. It's pretty neat. It followed the template that we gave you, too. The template for the list said, a template for a list of x. If the list is empty, we do one thing. Otherwise, we do something with the first of the list, and we combine it in some way with the result we get from applying the same function to the rest of the list. Now, in this particular case, we don't actually need to do anything with the first of the list. We simply need to count it. So our processing of the first element of the list is just adding one. And the combination is realizing that we are adding one to the results of the length of the rest of the list. Follows our template. We could just as easily write a function to sum a list using the exact same template. So to sum the list, let's just fill in the template differently. Well, if the list is empty, the sum of the list is zero. And if the list is not empty, then the sum of the items of the list is the nth item added to the sum of the remaining n minus one items. So, a teeny tiny change to that template and now we're summing the list. Oh, helps if I call it the right thing. Those two functions have very different purposes. 
They produced very different results. And yet the framework of those two functions was the same. That is the strength of a template. When you create a data definition, you create a template to really show, give people that framework, to show them how they can use that data type in different ways. It's also, once you've thought about how do I solve this recursively, that template serves as your base implementation. All you gotta do is copy, paste, and fill in the blanks. Saves you time. <coughs> All right. Any questions about this so far? All right. So, how do you do stepping with a recursive function? What are the rules? There's no new rules. You have 100% of the stepping rule, substitution rules you need to do stepping with recursion. So here we go. This is not uh, counting numbers. This is counting how many strings are in a list of strings. And so we call count concerts on a string or on a list that contains two strings. And since our argument is a value, a list is a value, and just for clarifications, lists are not atoms because they are compound data types. Uh, so our uh, argument is value. So we're going to substitute our argument into the body of our function. So we get all this con stuff substituted in here, and now we start our substitutions. So we start by evaluating, is the list empty? The list is not empty, so that evaluates false. And then in the next step, since this is false, we're just going to omit it. And then we see con else, well, else always evaluates to true. And so we're going to produce just the body, which is one plus count concerts on the rest of our list. Now, as you can see, this is getting really long. This was really long here. So in our notes, we are going to start omitting things by putting dot, dot, dot. This is not, uh, there's no rules to what we're doing to choose how we omit things. We are omitting things to save time and space. You need to know how to do this in full. We are just doing it in the slides because we need some space. Uh, when we ask you on an exam, please do the stepping for this particular thing. We expect you to draw it out in full. But we're not going to be jerks and ask you to do it on a list of 10 things because <laughs> I don't want to mark that. We'll do it on something that's actually you know, manageable in the amount of space that you have. So looking at the rest of this, you can see we can start omitting some things here with the dot, dot, dot. So now we're calling cons, count concerts on the rest of the list, which is cons be empty. And oh, that's a value. So we substitute the body, that argument into the body. And then we evaluate the cons again. The list is still not empty. So now we're going to call, we have plus one, plus one count concerts. And we keep going through here until finally, when the list is empty, in which case we produce zero. And since that condition is producing true, we end up with plus one, plus one, zero, and that gives us two. It takes a lot more substitution steps when we have recursion. Because we're going to be calling the function over and over and over again. No special rules, though. None at all. Now, a real condensed trace, that was just omitting certain things. We may often replace that full trace with just a few things omitted with this super condensed trace right here. And again, we are not expecting that you understand the rules we have applied to this condensed trace. This is just to save space. You still need to know how to do the step in here. So I'm mentioning that because you might be like, hey, what rules did we use to produce this? Yeah, there aren't any. We're just trying to save space. All right. So, there's some big problems with recursion, and that's the problem of termination. So, there are two parts to our templates for a recursive function. We always specify a base case. That's where we stop. 
that's the one, or maybe there's more than one base case because that's possible. It's the case where we know the answer. The answer doesn't depend on a function call of ourself. We know the answer. And then we have our recursive case. And our recursive case is the case that is going to actually rely on the result of a smaller problem. If you are missing the base case, or if you mess it up, i.e. you have the wrong base case, your program will go into infinite recursion and will not terminate. Now you might be wondering, well, is there a magical program that I can write to run my program through to check whether or not it will terminate or not? There's got to be a piece of code I can write to do that, right? No. That's impossible. You cannot write a program to give you the answer to whether your program will stop or not. You can't do that. This is actually, this concept of termination is actually a major theme in computer science. The proof of that particular um, claim I just made will be done in CS341. It's actually not a hard proof, but we're not going to do it, obviously. Uh, but it is a fun topic. Oh. Now, what does it actually look like in Racket when you write code that doesn't terminate? Well, let's go over and do it. This should be one of the number one things. You ask yourself, I really want to ask on Piazza, what happens if I do X? <laughs> the first thing you should do before you post that question on Piazza is open up Racket and try it. And then if you don't understand why what the result happened, then ask us. You can't hurt anything. So let's write a function that doesn't terminate and see what happens. So let's suppose, mm, I'm going to do a different one. Let's write a function that sums the numbers from 1 to n. And uh, I wrote the function wrong. I forgot my base case. Okay. There's nothing syntactically wrong with what I have just written. I can call 1 to n, and let's call it on the number 5. This should finish instantly, right? Well, maybe if we had done it properly. <laughs> la, 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 la. Let's wait for a minute. If your code starts taking a long time, you might have a problem. And if Racket detects infinite recursion, you'll get this nasty pop-up message. And I know you probably can't read it here. But it says, you have run out of memory, so we have stopped executing your program. Would you like to increase the amount of memory you use? Please don't say, yes, please increase my memory. Because then your program's just going to be frozen for longer. Recursion is not efficient. It used a lot of memory, and we ran out. This is what happens when you forget a base case. The program will seem to just wait. You'll get no response, no feedback, and then eventually in Dr. Racket, you'll get this pop up. Now, if you submit code to Marcus, or Marmset, whatever it's called, and you still have infinite recursion, obviously this is run automatically, and so there's no magical pop up. We have timeouts. So if your code does not run in X seconds, then we assume you have infinite recursion because no program in this course should take more than like half a second. And so we'll stop your code. So watch out. Now this isn't the only way you can get infinite recursion. There's other ways you can get it. The number one way that people get infinite recursion is they forget a base case. But I could get infinite recursion if I did this. So in my summing of a list, what if we know that I'm supposed to sum the nth item with the results of the sum from the n minus 1 items? What if I forgot that it was supposed to be for n minus 1 items and I said the sum of n items is the nth item plus the sum of n items? So in this case, it's the sum of the first of the list plus the sum of the list. 
So if I didn't say rest of the list, infinite recursion. In this particular case, the reason why we ended up with infinite recursion is because I wasn't combining the solution to n with the solution to n minus 1. I was combining n with the solution to n. I didn't make progress towards the base case. And eventually you'll get the pop-up and then we can get rid of it. This is why, for recursive things, you should be doing two things. Number one, you should be planning this out on a piece of paper. You, the hard part isn't the base cases. That's the easy part. The hard part is figuring out, how do I combine the nth result with the result for n minus 1? How do I combine those two things together to get the final result for n? The second thing that you need to do with a recursive function is follow that template because it will remind you of the format of the recursion. All right. Hopefully you won't get this out of memory error. It happens though. All right. So, what if I wanted to write a more complicated function? Maybe instead of doing something like counting the elements of the list or summing the elements of the list, maybe I want to know how many times a particular item occurs in a list. And we can do that too. And we don't need a different template to do this. So in the slides, they're going to show you the template well, they're not even going to show you the template here. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, we can fill it in here. What's our template? Our template is we do something with the empty list. And then if the list is not empty, then we have to do something with the first of the list and combine it with the result from the rest of the list. So if I want to count the number of times a particular item occurs in the list, instead of actually having two cases, I might now have three. Empty list. In which case, the item occurs no times. And then if the list's first item is equal to the item I am searching for, then I'm going to add 1 to the results of the count of how many there are in the rest of the list. But if the first item in the list is not equal to the thing I'm searching for, then instead of adding 1, I add 0. So I had to split the recursive case into 2. So what does that look like? Oh, I don't think you guys want to hear about multics. All right. So how do we do that? So I'm looking for some item n in my list. I'm still following the template. The basic framework is still the same, even though we're going to have an extra condition question. So if the list is empty, the item doesn't exist. Now, if the first of the list is equal to n, then we have found the thing we are looking for, and we're going to add 1 to the count of however many times this item occurs in the rest of the list. Apologize for all the extra letters. Um, my keyboard is broken and getting more broken every day. I just don't have time to get it replaced. In the other case, where the first of the list is not equal to the item we're searching for, we would just add zero to whatever's in the rest of the list. And now we can do count.
Let me get three. Now, technically speaking, I've written this function in this particular way for a reason. Because I wanted to do see that the format of these two cases were technically the same. It's just how we process the end item is different. We actually, in this else condition, we don't need the plus zero. Because the result of the current item not being what we're searching for, zero plus the count of whatever many times it shows up in the rest of the list is the same as just producing however many times it appears in the rest of the list. So technically speaking, while this is valid, that's cleaner and equivalent. Even though we have an extra case, it still follows the framework. This is the power of the template. We have written three or four different functions, and they all follow the exact same framework, the same template. All right. So there are instructions in the slides suggesting how you do things. I think I've given you enough of the good ideas to how we're do this, so I'm going to skip this slide. And they give you, in the notes also, a refined template for lists of x. And you'll notice here, this is the first time that they give you the refined template for a list of x. In the else case, for the non-empty list, instead of checking whether it's a non-empty list, they just say else. Because if the list isn't empty, it's obviously not empty. We've already used this template several times. Now, there is more to it than that. What you may have noticed is that all of these functions that we've written are very similar, not just because of how they follow the template, but we're always combining the result of the nth item through the result of the n minus that we get from applying the function to n minus 1 item. The recursive step always takes exactly one move closer to the base case. We actually have a name for this. It's called simple recursion. If your recursive steps move exactly one step closer to the base case, that's simple recursion. And there are many different kinds of recursion out there. So most people just refer to it all as the blanket term recursion. But there is simple recursion, there is uh, general recursion, there is generative recursion, and there is accumulative recursion, which is my personal favorite. Uh, but we're just going to deal with simple for now. So to give you some examples of function templates that are simple versus not simple, we have this here. So if you have a function that consumes a list, and the recursive step looks like applying that function to the rest of the list, it's simple. We moved one step only closer to our destination. Now, sometimes our functions may consume a list and some other thing. So long as when we call that function, we are only modifying the list and moving it one step closer to empty, still simple. We can't modify this variable here. This has to stay the same. Now, if Instead of moving one step closer to empty, we move two steps empty, or three steps towards empty, or we did something else to our list. That's not simple recursion. Simple recursion is moving exactly one step closer to base and doing nothing else. So this is not simple, and neither is this. So technically speaking, when we're operating on our list, it, the list is moving one step closer to base. But we are also applying some mathematical function to our second variable, x. And believe it or not, that might impact when we reach that base case. So that is not simple either. All right. Now. There are lots of other built-in list functions you should be aware of. And um, sometimes you're allowed to use them and sometimes you're not. Please pay attention to the assignment instructions so that you know when it is safe and is not safe to use them. There is the function length. 
So we actually wrote two length functions. There's one in the notes, and I wrote one in here in bracket. You don't need to write a length function. It exists. <laughs> uh, that's why I didn't call my length function length, is because it already existed. Uh, and length takes a list of any and produces a nat. And if you pass length empty, that is an empty list, an empty list has length zero. There are also functions like member. Member is a predicate. <coughs> and what member does is it consumes a list of any and an item that is also of any type and it produces true if that item exists in the list and false otherwise. So it's checking whether an item is in a list. Now that's a function we may not allow you to use all the time, so please do be careful with it. There are other functions for lists like reverse and append, and those ones we rarely let you use, so please be very careful with those. All right, so. Any questions about this stuff so far? Yep? So if we want to use functions like member, would we be able to create our own open function? <laughs> yeah, so usually we'll be pretty specific and say you cannot <laughs> use member, nor can you write your own version of it. And reasons why we might say that is because we want you to do the recursion in a different way. We want you to think about the problem in a different way. Um, there's lots of functions that are actually really, really easy to write if we let you use member, reverse, append, and all of those, but they may not be necessarily efficient or helping you see different ways of using recursion, so we often use them. I can tell you when I first learned Scheme, we were not allowed to use append, we were not allowed to use reverse, we weren't allowed to use pretty much anything, um, and we also weren't allowed to write our own versions. That was fun. But that was like 20 years. All right, any other questions about these lovely things? Okay. So, there's some other cool things that you can do. So first off, I'd like to do this, instead of going through the slides, I'm gonna open up bracket and do this uh, there as well. One of the things you're going to find very irritating for the next little while about working with lists in Racket is every time you want to create a list to use in a test, you've got to create a constant that's cons1, cons2, cons2. What a pain. It would be really nice if you could write a function to produce the list for you. Do that. You can absolutely create a function to make a list for you. And what's even better is it's a simple recursive function. It follows that very basic template of having a base case and having a recursive step that is combining some result of the nth item with the result for the n minus one and combining that together. It's a simple recursive function. Let's suppose we wanted to create a function that produces a list of the numbers from five to one, because it's easiest to do it in reverse order. Well, Let's think about that. What's our base case? Well, our base case would be n is equal to zero. If n is equal to zero, then I should produce empty. Because there should be no items in my list. So I produce empty. And if n is equal to one, that's cons of one onto the solution for n equals to zero, which is empty. And if I want to produce a list of the numbers one and two, then that's two cons on to the list of the numbers from one to one. And the solution for the list of the numbers from five to one is five cons on to the solution for printing the numbers from four to one. Okay, we've thought about it recursively, now let's put it into the framework. We're not going to consume a list this time. We're going to consume a number, just a number. And if the number is equal to zero, I produce empty. Otherwise, cons n make list 
minus n1. Now, I know in our simple recursive rules, it said, oh, you can't apply a function to the variable n. But actually, in this case, we can, because this is making exactly, there's only one argument, and this here is making exactly one step towards our base case, and that's it. It's equivalent to rest, you could almost think of it that way. So this is still simple recursion. And this works. So now we can just do make list. I want a list of the numbers from 5 to 1. There we go. Now if you're wondering what this funny quote empty brackets is, that is the internal representation of empty. Because brackets lazy and doesn't want to write the word empty. There. You just wrote a function using simple recursion and the basic template we already had for lists so you want to do this in a future assignment for what reason? Yeah, so like maybe you need uh, this function to produce some list for tests. You can absolutely do that. So long as we have, uh, so long as we are permitting you to use recursion, you can do this. It's totally fine. Yeah. And by the way, there's actually a built-in way of doing it. You're just not allowed to use the built-in yet. <coughs> Later. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to leave that here for today. We will continue with simple recursion on lists, and then natural numbers uh, on Thursday.